Hey guys, and welcome to part four of our series, which is all about moving your medical career to Australia. In this part, we're going to talk about looking for a job. I'm Dr. Caroline. And I'm Dr. Sasha. And we are from Code You Australia, where we help people revive, survive and thrive in their medical careers. Hey guys, and welcome to part four four of our series which is all about moving your medical career to Australia. In this part we're going to talk about looking for a job. I'm Dr Caroline and I'm Dr Sasha and we are from Code You Australia where we help people revive, survive and thrive in their medical careers. So if you've gotten to this part you have um, passed your AMC1 if you're going through the standard pathway or you didn't need to pass that because you went through the competent pathway and you've got your English test. And now you can actually start looking for employment. Exciting. Very exciting, but also huge challenge in itself. Like where do you even start? You get heaps of people telling you different information um, and, you know, just, just the general nature of needing to know like geographically Australia so you know which places you can even apply for. Such a for. big country, so many options. Yeah, so it can be very, very confusing um, and that's why in this podcast we are going to try to simplify it and break it down for you. So the first thing we need to know about looking for a job, we actually need to know the difference between a campaign and a job ad. Now there's already a video on our YouTube channel that speaks about this and compares the two. I won't go into complete detail but I will have a link to that video in our caption below so you can click on that and go and have a listen to that but just a general overview so what is a campaign a campaign is um, when each state in Australia puts up a job ad for people to apply for this year to start work next year and I think I didn't understand it at all but it what it's basically saying is this is the amount of positions we have available as an intake of the doctors that we're going to hire for the coming year. Yes. And also what is confusing is that each state in Australia functions independently, almost like a separate country. Yes. With different dates and different requirements, different sites, different everything really. So it's not like a one copy and paste for each state. It's really like applying to different countries. And that's the thing, like compared to other countries, that process, because it's not just one one website, one centralized way of applying, it makes it very difficult because the first thing you need to know is, do you know all your Australian states and territories? I did not. No, I don't. I grew up here and I'm not sure if I still do. But um, in fact, on our um, on our post with all the campaign states, the pictures, it took me a while. Yeah, <laughs> it took me a while. It took you a while to actually have the right state to the right wording. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, Thank so goodness you audited it. Yes, luckily I did. So we actually have a um, post where we have the links to all the different states and their websites so you can apply for a campaign job or a job ad. So And it's actually very useful. You know, um, I, I applied to a couple of campaigns for next year and I actually use it our own post yeah it is it's so useful it's very um it's very streamlined Mm. it's very clear so please have a look at that we're going to put that link in the caption as well so that is the issue every state in australia or territory operates on its own rules so every um they run by their own state law and that's the problem here so let's just quickly go over the different states and territories because these are the different locations that you can apply through their individual campaigns so the first one is new south wales so plenty of hospitals in New South Wales. Basically, Sydney. Yeah. So Sydney. <laughs> if you know is, Sydney, yeah. it's New South Wales. It's New South Wales. But yeah. New South Wales is huge. So there's lots of job opportunities because you can do like metropolitan Sydney. You can do out by the central coast. You can do more rural country in New South Wales. So they've got um, their own website where you can look for jobs through the campaign or and a job ad. I think what applies to all the states is if you recognize the name of that city in that state, chances are unlikely that you're easily going to get a job in that that place because the more regional and rural the easier it is for especially IMGs but anyone to get a job Um, for instance 
you've obviously heard of Sydney. Sydney's very competitive, but there's a lot of regional and rural places in New South Wales that have tons of vacancies open that people have probably never heard of before, thus don't actually even go for it. Yes, a, a lot of my um, IMG friends actually got regional New South Wales and pretty easily as well. Mm. So, um, But these were also Australian citizens who were went overseas, exactly. just like me, who went overseas and did their medical degree. So they knew exactly where to apply because they knew the ge- ge- you know the, the geography geography of yep. australia but i mean i'd only heard of sydney and new south wales yeah and most people do um so the next one and is byron bay byron bay's queen oh it's now oh. you're testing me because i know <laughs> wait wait wait. i know byron bay oh god the australians are gonna cringe how does this australian not it's know? in new south wales by, by, oh see i knew it was on the cusp of queensland it's on the cusp look, though look. i'll give it to you i'll give it oh. to you just I've you know it, I've always said it's always cheaper to travel outside of Australia than in Australia. That's why a lot of Australians haven't seen their own backyard. It's so expensive. I'm going to yeah. blame that. Yeah, you guys go to Bali. Yeah. yeah, it's cheaper to go outside. Mm, so okay. um, poorly <laughs> travelled within Australia. That was so hor- horrible, embarrassing. <laughs> I should have my citizenship revoked. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so the next one is the Australian Capital Territory. So it's not a state, it's a territory. And this is just mostly Canberra, right? Canberra, so our parliament. Yes, that's right. And actually for ACT or Australian Capital Territory, their like campaign actually runs through, can- like it's it's called Canberra. Yes. Because like the only, I suppose, campaign that runs in ACT is Canberra. Yep. And Canberra is the capital of Australia. Yes. So, so it's, it makes sense. Yeah. And I think <laughs> it's also another solid um, choice because not everyone, I mean, people find Canberra really boring. They don't want to live there. It's cold. And Canberra is like this tiny little place it in is. the middle of Victoria. Uh, well, no, it's not in Victoria because it's its own territory. But like it's but there. It's, it's, it's there. It's like, it's like in between. It's inland? Yeah, it's, it's, oh, now you're testing me again. <laughs> so it's down, <laughs> it's south. Yeah. And it's sort of like between New South Wales I, and I Victoria. Just it, I found it interesting. It's this tiny, tiny little yeah, territory. Yeah, And all it the is. other territories are so vast. Yes, it is. And it's our capital. Weird. I Why? Know, it's so weird. Ah, but I feel anyway. like they just wanted their own state for their capital. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yep. So the next one is Victoria. So if you've heard of Melbourne, that's mm. where Victoria, Mel- well, Melbourne's in Victoria. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the same rules apply to what you said. Like if you've heard of it, then like chances are lots of people apply there because it's very metropolitan, it's in the city. So if you think of more rural Victoria places, you're more likely to get, you know, successful posts there. And can I just say the rural or regional posts are beautiful little towns like or beautiful areas like a lot of places are on the coast so just because you're not living in sydney or melbourne does not mean that you're not going to live a you know beautiful full life and take it from me i actually was born and raised in sydney and i hate living in sydney like i loathe living in sydney don't listen to caroline sydney's great no because um (laughs) when i got to experience sort of like regional living or just a smaller state it's it's just great. Like the lifestyle is better. It's usually cheaper, less traffic. You ha- can live in a better place, Suppose closer to depends, the beaches. Depends what does it for you though. Yes. Big city yeah. vibes or small town vibes. Yes. You've, so you've so many options for both. I think the point being like just because something's regional, don't think of what you see on TV, the outback with like red dirt. Yes, and this is like something I had to learn. one tin shed um, and like dingoes everywhere. That's not – you're not that rural. When they say rural or regional – in Australia, they don't mean that. No, no. Rural or regional is still pretty formal. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's really important. Because when we to say know. rural or regional in South Africa, we mean rural. Yeah. No. Regional. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Like you are lucky to buy groceries. There. We we have a few places like that in Australia, but very rarely does anyone yeah. like. They won't shunt you to yeah, those places. No. No. Um, and I think the important thing to know for Victoria is that. Um, unlike all the other states, Victoria doesn't have like one website that, you know, controls the job ads for all of Victoria. I mean, each hospital has their own website and their own campaign. So that's where it gets messy is you the can, Victorian one. Yeah, but you can go on the PMCV, um, that pathway where you can make a profile there yes. and you can look at jobs through the PMCV. Yeah. So what it, well, we need to tell them what the PMCV is first. So it's basically post um, medical graduate council, and each state has one. And um, it's they look after like IMGs and junior doctors and training. So they think about these things. So that's a great place to start, and we'll put that link in the caption. That's also on our um, campaign post. Yes. 
So then we move to South Australia. So if you've heard of Adelaide, that's where South that's where it's um, located in South Australia. Now South Australia is huge because while Adelaide is the very metro place, um, it's massive. So there are a few regional posts, but actually quite beautiful, beautiful regional state. posts. Like and South Australia is beautiful. The wine region in South Australia and I mean, is there is good wine. Oh, there. good wine, uh, good cheese. I good would food. argue that's like the main region you should apply there. Yeah, and the beaches are amazing. In I fact, love I South might Australia. There. <laughs> I love South Australian beaches. Amazing. Um, so beautiful. And I've lived in South Australia. I've lived in Adelaide. It's um, still busy enough. So it's not, it's, you know, not busy like Sydney or but Melbourne. But quite small towny as well. Yeah, but mm. still easy to get around. Um, really it's, beautiful. Yeah, nice and the restaurants are lovely. Like the mm. food is getting up to the Melbourne level of food. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Melbourne's food though. Good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So then we move over to Western Australia. It's a huge, huge state. And lot, okay, so this is probably. All I know about it, Perth. Yes, Perth. But this is actually where you probably could find those extremely rural posts because it's so vast. It's so big. But however, before you can find those extremely rural posts that you're worried about, you can probably find a more regional, like it's still a small town. It's still beautiful to live in, coastal. So um, definitely look into that as well. Then we move up to um, a territory, so Northern Territory. This is the one I think that eludes me the most even to this day because I think being outside of Australia and living in other countries, you don't hear much about the Northern Territory. You don't um, because a lot of people don't move there. It's quite rural and quite hot too. It's quite rural. It's quite hot. There's extreme Um, weather. There is extreme weather. You get Darwin there, but... Mm. Um, also oh yes, Darwin is probably what people would know it for. Hey? Yep. Mm. And it's also like you really need to know your Indigenous health. health. That's yeah. really important because the Indigenous population is quite large up there and that comes with all sorts of medical conditions. So mm. you need to know really good Indigenous health. Um, then the other one, we move across, you know, and we go to Queensland. Queensland's huge as well. So Brisbane. Brisbane, Gold Coast. Once again, mm. the more regional you go in Queensland, you get these beautiful tropical you know, coastal places. Yeah, Queensland's beautiful as well. And I had a lot of friends that got a lot of success in regional Queensland, even for internships. Mm. So then we're missing one more off the map and that's the one that's not connected. It's separated by ocean and that is Tasmania and that's the state. Oh, almost forgot about Tasmania. Yeah, yeah. So once again, all of Tasmania is actually considered regional slash rural. So there's no like real metropolitan area. But if you've ever gone to Hobart, um, it's you wouldn't think. Oh, I'm in regional city right now. I mean, now. it's a big city. It is it's a big beautiful. city. Yes, but a lot of people get success in Tasmania as well. Yeah. So you really need to know about these states and territories, and then you need to see the links to each of their um, websites for jobs, because then they put the campaigns, they advertise the campaigns on there. So a campaign is basically the state or the hospital advertising this year, say for intake for next year. So you would put in your application and the applications aren't open all year round. It's just for like two or three weeks. You put in your application, they go through it at some point, they contact you at some point within the year and then they do an interview process and then they'll offer you a position usually starting for the following year. So 2023, January. And remember as well, for each campaign, for each state, the dates are different. So it can really be a juggle trying to keep up if you're looking for particular type of jobs or particular um, working in particular departments. You'd have to keep track of all those different dates. Like this campaign might open in June and end in like middle of July, but that one might only open in August and then end in the middle of October. So um, it really it does become a juggle to manage yeah. all of that. And there's like a junior doctor campaign, there's a registrar campaign. So um, they also run on different dates, even though it's from the same state. So mm. you just got to keep your eye on them and pencil those dates into your calendar. I'd say start looking from May at all the campaigns. Yeah, absolutely. They That's open a- up so early and they just carry on until the end of the year. Yep, very much agreed. Look into, um, start from May. So then you need to know what a job ad is. Now, a job ad is looking for, a, a, you know, a doctor to, for now really it's, it's for like now an opportunistic yes it's yep. job ad yeah so i'll give you like a proper example let's say um i'm working as a junior doctor in my hospital and then i tell them that i'm quitting 
uh, or, or let's say I get promoted to a registrar. So technically, according to your contract, you have to give, um, depends on how long you've been working there, but you might need to give four weeks notice. So in four weeks time, I'm either gonna resign or let's say I get promoted. How, well, either way, there's a junior doctor position that's gonna open up and be available. So that hospital already knows that in four weeks time, we're gonna be understaffed by one. So we need a doctor to fill in that spot. So they'll put these job ads out there and they are looking for a doctor that can essentially start right away. That is the ideal candidate. Someone who already has registration that can get in and go. So that's really important. Now, if they can't find someone who can start right away, they're happy to like take an IMG who's never worked before, but knowing that it's going to be about a four to six month wait on APRA registration. So the, this doctor will start in about four to six months. So you can see the hierarchy, the priority in their mind. The first priority is they wanna replace that doctor with someone who's already got registration that can start immediately. The second one is if they can't find anyone for that, then they'll go for someone who is an IMG that needs registration, they'll wait four to six months. Because you know why? Not because they wanna wait four to six months, they just have no choice. So why do you need to know the difference between the two? It's all about your success rate. A hospital that is trying to hire someone through a job ad, so someone's quit and or gonna resign or is gonna get promoted and they've got this small time frame to fill in that position, they're going to want somebody that is in the country. So in the country with working rights and preferably already has registration. If they can't it's get ready that- Ready to go. Ready to go. If they can't get that, they will happily take somebody that's in the country with working rights and who doesn't have registration. You cannot be ready to start that job if you're in another country. It will take you way longer than four months to ever get anything ready. So you always see on these Facebook IMG groups, people saying, I applied for 40 jobs this year and unsuccessful for all of them. And then that really makes you worried and thinks, oh, you know, what chance do I have? They applied for 40 jobs. What I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes these people don't know why they weren't successful, not even for an interview. And knowing what you're applying for, so job ad versus campaign and what kind of candidate you are um, is really important to A, not waste your time because your time is precious too, but also understand that it's not because they don't want you. It's just maybe because you're outside of the country and you're not the ideal candidate. It really doesn't affect your self-esteem in a way. And um, some states and in most of the states and campaigns that actually have a dedicated place where they actually know a lot of IMGs are going to apply. So they look out for more than they expect those delays whereas I suppose with the job ads they're not expecting to deal with delays so they probably you know you're less likely to get those jobs and it's less understanding yeah and I guess also if like what we're saying earlier if the job ads from one of the metropolitan hospitals oh no like let, let's go to the Royal Prince Alfred in New South Wales um if the if it's from there that's like smack bang in the city a very prestigious hospital work at they know they can replace that they, person with actually even a local they grad. Sudden, they don't even need an IMG. Sudden, get out of here. If they suddenly get an opening for a training post in the middle of Sydney. Yeah. You, you, they're not taking you. They're not taking you. So um, They're not taking us. Why, they're not taking no, you. No, they're not even taking us. Don't worry. So um, that's, I guess, like why a lot of people are unsuccessful. And then it, that their story makes other people anxious and depressed mm. and think like they don't have any hope. So, so you need to know what they're looking out for, who the ideal candidate is. Now, if you're outside of the country, so you're not here yet, then your best shot is through a campaign because they can start interviewing you this year and you can start the visa process and get yourself over here for starting next year. So you've got time. The hospital has time, more importantly. Yeah, and like I said, May, May or June, I mean, that gives you ample time to start like the next year, end of Jan, Feb, where most of the campaigns do start. Um, well the posts start so that's that's more than enough time to sort everything out yeah so that's really really important to know um, what so what type of candidate are you so what are your pros what are your cons to the hospital not like to yourself just to the hospital and what would be your best chance of applying so um, you know you're outside of the country you want to go through a campaign you also want to go to a more regional location where most of that hospital is staffed by IMGs compared to staff by local doctors because if they're mostly staffed by local doctors they don't really need an IMG mm. so you kind of want to start thinking like where is my best chance like what are the less competitive roles I mean you don't have to stay in that role but just you know to get your foot in the door and get a job 
um, go for less competitive positions, then you can always level up later. Yeah, and that's another thing. Like when people say I applied for 40 jobs, I sometimes wonder like I'd love to see what job titles you applied for because um, – Or like it, where? Are yeah. all 40 of those in Melbourne and Sydney? Yeah, because that's another then, thing. Then, yeah, it's setting yourself up for failure. You need yeah. to cast a wide net. Yes, very, very true. So – um, I guess also like what role are you applying for? So, um, so a lot of people apply for positions that say the word trainee. Trainee is mm. under the assumption that you're in the Australian training school for that specialty. So, like, As in paid the money to the college, written the primaries, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. So if you haven't even worked in Australia yet, that's not you. That mm. post is not appropriate and for you to apply for. And I think where the confusion for. comes in is that in many other countries, say you're a registrar in your own country or you're training in your own country, that training is not um, equivocal in Australia. Like that time that you've done there doesn't mean much here, unfortunately. So you can't just go straight into a training role that you would see as equal to the role that you are in your country now. Yeah, yeah. You always have to like, unfortunately, like try to level down to ensure success and then you know level up again later yeah. that's what you did right yeah that's pretty, exactly what you had did. pretty like um you know extensive mm. clinical postgraduate experience but you took a junior doctor role here yeah yeah definitely so but just because um i i knew from talking to other people that this is more likely how you would get in yeah and i think hospitals also um they like taking experienced people from overseas as junior doctors because it's sort of like less risky mm, on their end. Exactly. So, that's but really even important. coming from another country, it's it, it just makes more sense to go into a lower role where you have less. Um, you know, you don't want to go straight into a training role, even if it was offered to you, because you don't know the system, you don't know anything about this new healthcare system. So, I wouldn't have felt comfortable to start off in something more senior. Yeah, and I guess in our next. Um, in the next podcast as well, we actually talk about um, what you need to do to pass that year that you're working in. So if you took something senior and you think, oh, that's all right, I've taken something senior, I've got my foot in the door, I'm going to be fine. You actually have a lot of things you need to pass in your first year of work and prove. So if you take, like if you, you know, take too much and you can't handle it, you're going to ruin your whole entire medical career in Australia. Like if you don't pass these things and you don't get general registration, you're done. Mm. So so just swallow your pride just for you. Yeah. So just you've got to think strategic about it and just think like, okay, I just, one, need to just get my foot in the door. And two, I just need to survive until I get general registration. And then after that, I and can... you're free. You're free. And you can work towards whatever your goal is and work, you know, work towards being as senior as you was as you were back home if not more or work into the specialty that you were working in back home yeah so that's really important so like to summarize apply for appropriate jobs so anything that says trainee you cannot apply for it because you're not in the training program in the australian specialty school um junior doctors now the name for junior doctors is different in er in almost every state and also um bit of a misnomer as well because the junior doctors are not all junior doctors like they are it goes from interns it, it's just basically another way of saying all doctors that are not in training programs yeah yeah so it doesn't mean that you just uh, an intern or you've only got one or two years experience there are people that are in junior doctor roles with tons of experience but they're just not considered senior in australia yet until they are actually in training yes yeah. So um, really important, if you want to know what role you're actually applying for, we have a post on the different names that they call a junior doctor in different states. So please head over to our social media account and you can have a look at those names. So if you know, if you see the name like Senior RMO or you see the name JHO, you know that it's all... HMO. Yeah, it's all, oh, that's the whole junior doctor. That's f that's what I need to apply for. So that's really clear on applying for the right role. Role, Don't waste your time. Okay, so let's go to the second part here where we're going to talk about CV, so resume and a cover letter. Because if you find the role, now you want to apply for it. Okay, so we need to know what a cover letter is. Are these just the main two things that they would ask for? for um, these jobs? Yes, mm. yeah. For the most part, it is. Most part, it's just these two things. Yes, mm. and this is something that IMG do terribly. Um and it really does All, affect yeah. their chance. All IMGs. I didn't know what a cover letter was. Yeah. So let's, well, that's that's where we need to start right there. So let's say, let's talk about what is a cover letter and what is a resume. So resume is a CV. 
It can be multiple pages where it goes through your personal information, your qualifications, and then more detail about those qualifications and where you are registered. So things like that. Um, I think everyone is pretty much familiar with what a CV and a resume and can is. I, can I just confirm as well? Because this is actually something that I was thinking of with my own CV. What is a appropriate length for a CV? Because you want it to be, you said pages, but I mean, you want it to be concise yet also include all the relevant information yeah so, so i've had cvs that are like six pages seven pages too much and oh, it, it is absolutely too much however this is where this is where a bit of a strategy and a tip comes into play um i've had p- cv that a cv that's two pages and so messy and hard to read and not formatted well that i much preferred reading the six page cv that was like structured well I when I read something I could understand it Um, it was nice you know nice to look at it was formatted and it was in a good um, content outline and like a progression of information yeah because some people actually generally have a lot of qualifications that are not going to fit on two pages so what I would say is fit it on the minimal amount that you can if you can get away with three pages great if you can't and you have to do six pages fine But just make it really clear, make it nicely formatted, the font all equal. Like you'd be surprised how many people are using six different fonts. So um like so focus more on how it reads. Yes. Rather than uh I need to make it as concise as possible. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um and I guess focusing on how it reads comes down to knowing what they want on there, which we're just we're gonna discuss in a in a second. Um, So then we talk about cover letter. A cover letter is one page and one page only. Small font? (laughs) Not small font. No. One page. And what it really is, is just designed to summarize the key points from your CV on one page. And these key points is not what you think is important. This is where people go wrong. The key points is what you think the hospital is looking for. And this, and I'll tell you why, because admin people in hospital are usually doing 6,000 jobs, but being paid for one job only. They're very stressed, they're not paid that great, and they're very time poor. When you give them like a six page, poorly formatted CV, they're like going through it and probably not even thinking or like not, not really concentrating. You give them a one page CV and it ticks all the things that they're looking for, that they don't have to go through your cv and find all that information themselves like it's all written on the cover letter in dot point tick 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 what i do Uh, in bullet points in bullet points what i do i actually look like does this person have a b c d i'm looking for great now i'll go to their cv otherwise don't waste my time like oh they don't even they can't even work in australia or Mm. um oh they don't even have amc1 i'm not bother going to look at their cv not interested Mm. so um that's really important so it really just gives a chance for the person that's trying to be efficient at their job not spend too much time on a candidate that doesn't even have the things that they need to actually get employment. So that's really important. So it's a one page dot point to the point of all the ideal traits that they think the hospital's looking for. And it's basically saying to the person reading it, look more into my CV. Like I've got everything you need. Look more into my CV. That's what it's designed for. So do working in admin, do you, do you guys read the cover letter first and then the CV? So working admin, if I'm lucky enough to get a cover letter, I already, you know what I already go in my head? Yep, I'm interested because IMGs don't provide a cover letter. Australians do. Oh. Yeah. So already I'm like, yep, I already like this person. I'm going to look more because you know what? The fact that they made an effort to do a cover letter and um, I'm already interested. So I look at it. Wow. Good and to then know. I, and I quickly look at that. And I'll be honest, like a lot of the cover letters I've looked at haven't been the greatest. But I still go ahead and read their CV and just make sure that all the things that I need that are ticking off in my head, make sure that they have it. I I suppose if you're not thinking of how you are formatting and presenting the information, you're doing yourself a disservice. You could have a Nobel Prize and it can get lost in all that um, poor formatting. Yeah. So you could have all these achievements and people are just not actually noticing because you're not delivering it well. And you know what I do a lot? Like I actually look at people's CVs and I write on them because I'm trying to decipher the information like, okay, when did they graduate medical school? And then I write on the back of the CV and I do my own dot points. That's pretty nice of you because so I think most admin staff would probably just be like, oh, no. Yeah, they do. They go on to the next. But because being an IMG, I just, I generally know what it feels like 
to some like to someone to just disregard your cv so i generally try to see like okay is this person a good candidate if they've got everything we need it's just the fact that they haven't really written it very well and i'm sitting there sometimes for ages like doing the dot points that i would i would have liked to see on the cover letter that they didn't provide and i'm doing it on their cv i'm actually writing on their cv and it's a mess and i've been there for sometimes 20 minutes trying to work out i don't get it so how many years postgrad experience does this person have like three three two six like oh did they take a gap in this year this is confusing because just the way they've written it but had you done it in your cover letter i could have just read straight off the bat like three and a half years experience one year career gap um raised child in that career gap like i could have got to the answer quicker so people had the luxury with me that i was an img that i knew i knew like the the, predicament the predicament so but most of the people in admin are not IMGs. Unfortunately. No, and they're already, to be honest, they're already tired of IMGs and they're already exhausted. So they, they're they not as patient, I mm. should say. So that's why it's really important to have both. So let's go talk about what needs to be in a CV and what needs to be in a cover letter. So what needs to be in a CV, um, I feel like everyone knows a resume. It needs personal information, your name, um, where it doesn't have to have your address, don't give away full on personal information, but your name, your mobile number, um, an email and where you are located. That's really important. Um, then the qualifications you've obtained um, and any qualifi- you know, qualifying examinations or bridging programs. Um, and then you want to do your clinical or procedural skills. So APRA likes to have like competent or observed. So you want to list those in a nice table. Then you want to talk about your work history. And work history is where a lot of people go wrong because it's just all over the place. Like you want to do from most recent to, you know, um, what was most in the past. So, and do it in order. Yes, they don't don't actually care where your high school and internship were done. Like they just want to know what you did last year. Yeah. And you don't like, to be honest, you don't need a lot of information for each one. No. What what you just want to know is like, okay, um, your last job was may 2021 where you worked as a resident medical officer at this hospital in this country and you worked Mm. in the following departments because i do that i go through people's cvs and i'm like okay in that when they worked as a resident there do they work in ed do they work in general medicine like i'm trying to work it out and it's a time waster do you know what i realized with my cv as well um because being from another country when i first came here obviously everything on my cv was not australian like i didn't all of the experience that i was listing was not australian so when i got a bit more savvy with the terms that were used here because i realized actually what they want to know is at what level did you work in in those roles where did you work and at what level were you working so i would write sort of the terms that the or the position description that it was in my country and then in brackets i would write um this is at a resident medical officer level in this country or this is at a junior registrar level at this in this country so so it can give them an easier idea of what my level was that i was working at because they don't that some of the terms are meaningless to them yeah, that's actually a really good idea. No, it's true. And it, it does translate differently. So I'm like just trying to work it out. And that's that's where it, a lot of time wasting goes for the admin person. So that's really important. So um, you also want to mention like any gap history that you had and possibly a reason why. So this way the person knows in general, you want them to walk away from your CV knowing like where are you located? Um, how many postgraduate ex- years of clinical experience do you have? how many years of gap you know do you have and why um and basically like what are your skills what can you do what can't you do and also um any like research or any um extra programs you've done like added extra like bonuses that's it that's it so that's you just want them to walk away with a clear understanding of that if you don't have a gap in practice do you think it's important on your cv to say i have no gap yeah go for it yeah go for it okay yeah um yeah, so the other issue with CVs that I see a lot is the formatting is terrible, like absolutely terrible. There's different fonts going on. The spacing is not there. It, it, in, and you know what that screams? And Unprepared. Unprepared, doesn't know how to use a computer. Immediately you're right off. Mm, unfortunately. Hey. And, 
and this is me being an IMG yeah. and and understanding how it goes and, and the actually giving it a second look and actually giving it a second look. Now imagine admin people; they'd be like, "No, nah, no," nah, because we've got you know computer systems here. Um, they can't even do this properly. No. Nah. And so probably even the worst local graduate doctor would still have an epic CV. Yes. Yeah, they would. Mm. Yeah. Um, because com- they grew up with computers. So that's really important that your CV shows that like I know how to use computer and I know, you know, the right information to write down and I take pride in my work as well. I didn't even think of it this way. Yeah. It's, yeah. But you'd be surprised how many I got that were horrendous. I feel like I should change the color of my fonts now. Yeah. You should go back and look over your fonts and mm. your spacing as well. I didn't even know how to use tab. Oh dear, we're in trouble, people. <laughs> um, well, to be fair, you're working as a doctor and you don't know how to use tab and you've been fine so far. So I know that, now. Yeah, so, <laughs> so if that is any reassurance to anyone out there, you don't need to be IT tech. And I, I tell you what, I always say this, the older you get, the worse you get with technology. In front of these really young junior doctors, I swear they must think I'm so silly with computers. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. It's just that I own a Mac at home and most of these hospitals have Microsoft, okay? So I'm <laughs> the age-old excuse. So it's just I'm not like I don't use Microsoft all the time. But they, I swear, I can, I can just feel their energy like, <laughs> oh, my God, this girl's so bad at this. Like, hurry up. And they know all these shortcuts. And I used to be that person. I, well, I definitely am still that person I when I'm around. Never my, that person. When I'm around my parents, I'm still that person. Like, oh my god, don't tell me how to take a picture on your phone. My god, it's so easy. So now, like, I am my mother and father. <laughs> this is quite concerning. <laughs> I have become them. When it, what they are to technology, I am to technology to these young junior <laughs> doctors. Oh, karma. Oh, that is yeah. karma right there, mm. isn't it? So, um, yeah, you don't need to be an IT whiz. You just, you just need to at least to get your foot in the door you need to look like you know how to do just a CV. use your common sense yeah 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 so let's talk about what needs to be on a cover letter so first in order to know what needs to be on a cover letter you need to know what is the ideal job candidate or what they're looking for when they're ticking off in their head whether this person is even eligible to work this is what they're ticking okay one have if you're going through the standard pathway have you passed your amc one exam so you want that on your cover letter and dot point. AMC one exam passed and then the, the date that you passed it. Then they want to know like have you passed your English test if you need to sit the English test. So um, you need to write that and when you passed it and when does it expire. Because I used to dig through people's CVs to know when it expired. Can I also just say that if you're going to be talking about the fa- fact that you passed your English test, when you're writing your cover letter, make sure it's written quite well as in, in English because – no point in saying, oh, yes, I've passed my English test, but then your cover letter is full of gram- grammar, um, grammatical errors and yep, yeah, that sends the wrong message. And that actually reminds me of a really good tip. If you're not great with grammar, and guess what? No shame here. I grew up and uh, was taught in this country <laughs> and I'm terrible with grammar. Terrible. And do you know what I use? You me? Prob- me? No, you I don't use, use you. <laughs> not all the time anyway. Um, there, You probably see the ads for this all the time. It's called Grammarly. And um, yes, there's a paid version that gives you a lot more um, options. But I used to use the free version all the time. So you can type in your paragraph or your sentence or your document into Grammarly. It's a web-based, it's a a website. So you don't need to download an app. You don't need to do anything. And it will correct your grammar and your sentences for you. So useful. And I've been, I know it sounds so silly, like I grew up here, but I've been learning like the classic mistakes I've been making because it also gives you like suggestions on why you made those mistakes. So guys, like I know the difference between there and there. Just kidding. I always knew that. But (laughs) Did you though? I did. No, I did. (laughs) But like, I'm not really good at writing. Writing school's never been, I've been more like a math science girl growing up. Classic ethnic family, <laughs> math science girl, debate, team, public speaking. That was me because that's all English my dad. took a back seat. That's all my dad would let me do. He didn't really want me talking or, or talking back. So uh, English was not promoted at all. Um, and also my parents, why else? I don't want to just blame them, but my parents are... Kara's parents getting blamed for a lot of like, stuff yeah. today. <laughs> but they were they came to Australia when they were like in their 30s. So they're so immigrants. You're second generation Australian. Yeah, and like growing up, I listened to the way they spoke English. And even you know, even to this day, my parents still make really horrible English mistakes. So in school, I didn't do well in English because I didn't have that very good grammar um, being represented in the household. 
So like I made those classic mistakes that my parents were making inside the house as well. That's actually probably a good point because just because you were born and grew up in an English speaking country, if you had immigrant parents, it, your English is probably not going to be the best. No, no. So it's, um, I mean, not every person who has immigrant parents, I know a few, quite a few that speak beautifully. It's just somehow that wasn't me. Um, you know, like to this day, my mum keeps calling the couch, coach. <laughs> and I'm like, mum, it's couch. She's like, we need to get new coaches. And I'm like, what? Why do we need a new bus? You're and doomed. Like, and she's like, couch. I'm like, you mean couch? How many times do I have to correct you? Couch. She's like, that's how you say it in French. I'm like, well, we're in Australia and you've been here long enough to know it's couch. So this is what I grew up with. Kids need to be nicer to their immigrant parents. Oh. This is what my kids are going to do to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's right we digress though so it's yeah it's but <laughs> anyway so that's also why but that's a really good website it's free so you can type your document in there and just see the mistakes that you're making and just make sure it sounds so okay it's a I little tip oh uh, so now when we talk about cover letters because i'm very unfamiliar with this topic before i moved to australia um do you think it's important to have a different cover letter for each job that you apply for as in rewriting your cover letter each time or do you have just one cover letter that you repurpose for all your job and job applications so i have one cover letter it's a template that i repurpose so what i do to make it personal is i go ahead and i change the location so like when i say i'm applying for whatever position it is so if they call it a junior medical officer position in that state but in another state they call it a junior house officer i go ahead and change that part and then to and then I n- name the hospital. So I change that. So for the most part, it looks like it was written for that specific hospital, but it is the same template. Oh, so you just change who it's addressed to. Yes, that's right. Because so, I, I also address mine to whichever job that I'm going to. Yes. I, I do change it. I think that that does add a good personal touch though. Yeah. Then those people reviewing that will think, you know, oh, she's actually addressing us personally, like yes. in this cover letter. It's not just a copy pasted. Yeah. That's right. Mm. And one thing I'll say about being a personal touch, um, what I saw a lot of IMGs do, their personal touch is saying, I look forward to one day being a part of your hospital. It's just so presumptuous. Mm. It's, and it's unnecessary and it feels unprofessional. Don't write that. Like just, just sign off nicely. Like I look forward to hearing from you Mm. full stop, kind regards, and then sign off your name. I feel like if you wanted to say something like that, you could say, Due to the above reasons, I feel like I would be a valuable member of your team or a valuable asset to your hospital. Yeah, that's yep. it. Yep. So, um, <laughs> not like see you next Tuesday. Thanks for the job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what else you need to put on your cover letter in dot point. So, you want to know the, how many in total post-grad experience you have. So, what PGY level you are. What departments have you worked in previously? And what is your recency of practice? That's a big one. So um, really important. I don't want to have to be going through your CV and finding out, oh, you last worked in 2017. Put it straight in the cover letter, like last worked as a doctor and then the year, okay? Month and the year preferably. Um, And then what are your working rights? So if you're located in Australia, that's a pro in your, you know, uh, that's a gold star in your area. So highlight that in a dot point, like, Lo- currently located in Melbourne, Victoria. Um, currently located in New Zealand. Currently located, like put where you are located. And then you want to put in dot point, have you passed your AMC1? If this is through the standard pathway, have you passed your AMC1 and an English exam and then the date you've passed that? So those are really, really important because when you're going through somebody's CV, that's, trying to, that's what I'm trying to work out anyway. I'm not trying to work out anything else because the reason being... Like what kind of registration are they eligible for? Yeah, and if yeah. they've... Like, are they even eligible to work in this hospital? Like, for example, if someone's recency of practice is 10 years ago and they have AMC1, the English exam, and they're located in New South Wales, I already know that I'm not going to put them at the top of the list because likely that they won't get registration. So I, why would a hospital go through all that time interviewing you, offering you a role... And then waiting on APRA for four to six months to come back and saying, don't, don't, denied because mm. no recency of practice. So they don't, hospitals can't waste their time because generally they need the spot filled and waiting for uh, IMG's registration is time wasting as it is. They don't want to waste any more time on top of that. So in order to get looked at your CV and cover letter, just make sure your, co- your cover letter has all those dot points that they're trying to work out in your head, whether or not you will either 
even, like even get registration if they give you a job and whether you've got all the things that they need for you to get a job. So that's really important. Like get to the point. Ooh. Very, very important. Good points. So let's talk about how to create a CV. Now, this really depends on time, money and skill. If you have poor, poor skill um, and no money, a good place to start is a free, the free APRA CV template. Now, this is the CV template that APRA wants you to submit your CV to them. Because when you're part of your registration process, you submit a CV to APRA as well. And they have their template. But the template is not too far off to what the hospital requires. I've so actually repurposed mine. So I did mine in the APRA template. And I've actually not changed the structure of it because it, it's a good structure it makes sense yeah um to so i haven't changed that even though it's not being submitted to upper all the time it's yep. um the hospitals like that like that kind of formatting anyway so. yeah it's just your stand it's actually a standard cv Very format standard. it's not like in any industry it's not even like specifically medical so if yeah you don't have money and you don't have good skill at least um get that and you can follow the format of that we also have a post on um, the APRA documentation that you might need when you're applying for limited registration where um, I've included the framework for the APRA CV if you guys want to check that out as well. Yep, so we're going to put a link in the caption um, to that APRA CV template so it's easy for you to find. Now, if you have poor skills but you're also time poor but money isn't overly an issue, you don't, you don't have a lot of money to spend the big bucks – but you want to outsource someone to do this CV for you and cover letter, a little um, tip is something called Airtasker. Now, this is a website. It's also got an app where you basically put your job offer. So the job offer is like, I need someone to write me a CV and cover letter and you can dictate the price for $50. Then the people who want to do it for you, who are capable of doing it for you, they bid for that offer. Like, oh, hi, I can help you with that. I can do it for $45. Or, hey, I can do it for $100. And then you go through their reviews and you pick one. And then you communicate back and forth through email and they will draft you a CV and cover letter. Um, and once you agree that you're happy with it, then that's it. Then the payment goes through at the end when you agree at the end when you receive the product. So this is really great for somebody who hasn't got the time or doesn't really have the skill but can't really afford a premium CV cover letter service. Then the last option, if you've got if you've got the money and you really want a premium cover letter and CV um, and you want to stand out, then this is probably, this option's for you. Just type in CV cover letter um, writers in Google heaps of companies will come up it doesn't even have to be medical because the cv is not specific to medical the format is not specific to medical stuff but um there are a few companies out there that will do medical cvs they do charge quite a bit do i think it's necessary no but if you generally do not think you can produce a good cv and you've got the money then yes i do think it's necessary so it's that's better than option. sending like a half job to the hospitals hey yeah, and what I will say is like you don't you don't need a CV to stand out like as in my font, my title's in orange and lavender and, you know, where everyone else's is black and white. You actually don't need that. You just need one that is formatted well and has the right spacing that looks like you know how to use a computer. That's all you need. Uh, w- another point I wanted to ask you, Caroline, the, the CV format on, say, Microsoft Word has a cover, so it's like an extra page that's just got – it's just like the cover of the CV. APRA doesn't like that. No, no one likes that. So admin staff also hate that. Yes. So yeah. I don't know why Microsoft Word suggests that. Yeah, don't know either. Take the cover away. Yes, 100% take it away. But actually um, Google Docs. So if you go to Google and you click on the right-hand side, the little grid on the top right-hand corner, and you go to their um, Docs, they have templates and they have a CV template completely free. Nice. So have a look at that. It's a good place to start. Just just somewhere to start. That's what you need to do. Okay, so let's say you have um, received a job. So first you would obviously receive an opportunity to interview. Now, that's a different uh, podcast. Um, look out for that one. So and an accomplishment in itself to yes. even get an interview is really yes. great. Yeah. 
Um, lots of elements in that one that um, and take every interview opportunity that you get. Just even if you don't, even if you know you're probably unlikely to get the job, just do it for the interview skills. Yeah, just the experience and absolutely. So let's say you got did the interview, you um, got granted the job. So now you've got congratulations. a job. Yeah, congratulations, <laughs> huge huge step. So what does that mean? So let's talk about limited versus provisional registration. If you went through the standard pathway and you only had AMC1 and your English test and you passed um, and you then got a job, you're actually eligible for limited registration. So only at this point when you receive the job with your hospital, do you sit down together because the hospital has a lot of documents they need to fill out and you have a lot of documents you need to fill out and then you submit that to APRA for limited registration. So this gets confusing because a lot of people think that once they pass the AMC1, oh, can I apply for limited registration? No. No. So limited registration only comes from when you get the job. Provisional as well. Yes. Yeah. So you've written your exams or you are eligible to work in Australia. That doesn't mean that you can go to APRA without an employer and say you want registration. So you won't be applying to this jo- these jobs with registration. You'll be getting the registration after you've gotten the job. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. So if you, um, the people that are eligible for provisional registration are the ones that went through the standard pathway and they got AMC 1 and 2, then they get provisional registration. Or you're on the competent authority pathway, in which case you are directly eligible for provisional registration without even having written AMCs at all. Um, so there's, there's that option as well. Yep. The only time you don't need to apply for limited and provisional registration is if you already got your foot in the door, you've been working under limited registration or provisional registration, and then you're changing hospitals. So that's a different story. Oh, so you're applying for a new job within Australia. Yeah, that's Changing it. jobs within yeah, Australia. Yeah. yeah, so that's different. So, But the, for the very first time ever, you can only apply for registration when you have the job, not before. So I hope that clears that part up of moving your medical career to Australia. I think there's so much to be said about jobs, interviews, CVs, cover letters. Um, and we'll be covering that in just various aspects of all our content across all our platforms. Yeah, absolutely. So um, really important, we have a Facebook and an Instagram account. If you're not following us already, head to those, type in Code you Australia and follow us. But more importantly, we have a YouTube channel where a lot of these videos, these podcasts make it to the YouTube channel and not to our social media accounts. So if you really enjoyed this video and you got something out of it, please head to our YouTube and click the subscribe button so you don't miss out on another video. Now, really important, um, click on our next part of this series where we talk about general registration. So you've gotten the job, you got your limited registration or provisional registration granted by APRA, but now you need to work your way to general registration. We're going to talk about everything to do with that. Thank you so much for listening to us today and we will catch you guys in part five of the series where we discuss general registration.